Welcome back to Thrive and Beyond. I'm excited today's guest, Erica De La Cruz, TV host, speaker, and passionista, is going to share a story of how she endured homelessness at the age of 19 while in college. Listen in as we share more, and thank you to everybody that pre-ordered the Thriving Beyond from Tragedy Triumph book. That is ended, but the book will be out early next year, 2017, and you won't want to miss when that launches. And thank you to everybody that supported and donated. You have helped Halo Inc. and PTS Faces. Let's get into this episode as Erica De La Cruz shares a story and more. Welcome to Thriving Beyond, the podcast with stories of thriving through when the obstacles are far from few. Here's your host, whose own story has been featured in Chicken Soup for the Soul, Vidal Cisneros Jr. Welcome to Thriving Beyond. We're excited. We have Erica. She's a television personality. She's a speaker and co-founder and author of the brand and book Passionistas tips, tales, and tweetables from women pursuing their dreams. And she's a recognized by the California State Senate's Women to Watch in 2016. And also she's been a host of Brian Tracy's 2016 Success Mastermind Academy. Now she is one of the youngest ever marketing directors at Intercom Broadcasting. Wow. And she's also an on-air personality. She's been on Blog Talk Radio and she's a host of Fashion Week San Diego. She's also a motivational speaker in the hashtag girl boss and Millennial Empowerment Movement. She is a host of Variety's A Night of the Star San Diego Film Festival. So she is highly decorated and very young, <laughs> I might add. Erica, we're honored to have you. Welcome to Thrive and Beyond. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of this, hearing lots about Thrive and Beyond. So thank you for having me as a guest. Absolutely. Thrive Nation is excited because Thrive she does Nation. <laughs> What's going on, Thrive Nation? I love that. Yes, Thrive Nation is excited because we're all about the empowering stories of thriving, not just recovering and surviving, but thriving. That's what the premise of the show is. So, Erica, if you could sum up what you do out in the world in one sentence or less, so like your tagline for when you get up on stage, what is that tagline? What is that one sentence that you do out in the world? Okay, the one sentence I do out in the world, uh, the tagline. Well, let's see, with everything I do combined, it'd probably be help people live the happiest lives possible and thrive in their industry and really step into their spotlight by empowering them to share their story. Right on. Love that. Okay. Yeah. So I know you like working out, right? As <laughs> I, I do. do. You guys can't I do. See, you guys can't see us obviously uh, as a podcast, but we're both in our like kind of like gym gear, right? I've been pumping some mad iron. <laughs> like, luckily, this is just audio, but I am in all my glory right now. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to the working out ritual. So what's a morning ritual that you implement in your in your routine to ignite your day? Oh, totally. Yeah, I think well, it's interesting that you mentioned working out because I totally subscribe to the term mental fitness. And so I think that the mind is the most important organ part of yourself, your body and your soul that you can condition. And the morning is when it is most like imagine birth, right? You're most susceptible to everything when you're just this tiny little newborn. So every morning you wake up and that is when the mind can either consume the best of the best to you know empower you for the day, or when you can get inundated with all the to do lists and things that were on your mind probably the night before. So my morning ritual usually consists of either a visualization or a uh, gratitude exercise. So if it's a visualization, I love some Bob Proctor. He's like old school abundance theory. And he will, you can pop that in on YouTube. That's a great one. And then gratitude exercises are totally my favorite. I just go crazy thinking about the things that I'm grateful for, either listing them in a journal, totally doing it mentally, and just doing some visualization for all the things that I'm grateful for. And that's all followed by picking the best mug. So I'm a big, big, big on aesthetics. And I think that your environment lends as well to the type of work that you're doing, the type of results that you're producing. So every morning, I make sure to pick a mug that kind of matches my mood. And sets the tone for my day, because the next thing I do is hop on my computer. So if I'm looking at if I'm being creative, I'm probably looking at, you know, some sort of zebra or Disney mug. If I'm doing research, I have like my Boston Tea Party mugs, my solid color, like, you know, the hustle mugs, all those that I own. So it's a little quirk, but I love it. I love that. I love how you just personalized the whole question. <laughs> That's awesome. 
So Yay. a little a little feng shui, so to speak, get the right mm-hmm. things in, in your environment. And Bob Proctor, absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely down with some Bob Proctor. I and... love Bob Proctor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then you mentioned gratitude. That is, I think that's always mentioned on this podcast episode, if not, mm-hmm. if not once, many times. So that's what we love yeah. to do here. You can identify trends. That means it's probably working for a lot of people. Be grateful. Yeah. Amen. Got me through all of my toughest life storms. So let's get into your toughest life storm. So if you could take us from like the global 10,000 feet up in the air view and then come down to the curbside street view so we can see daily how it was and what you were feeling and what that looked like from your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And this is like the toughest, one of the more tough things that I've had to deal with and overcome probably. Yeah, that probably came in a, uh, well, during the lovely year of 2008, 2009, and that whole economy shift, I was uh, just starting to pursue a little bit of my career in in college. I was a freshman at the time, and my family back home, both of my parents were entrepreneurs. They had a restaurant for 26 years. We designed and built the house I had grew up in, and Actually, while I was away at my first year of college, I returned after that year to find that the house was being foreclosed, the business was closed, my father went into some depression, and um, my mom was sort of left on her own to make sure that everything was being held up, if you will, and she was trying to save the house and didn't, wasn't able to do that, so I arrived for summer, and imagine being like 19 years old, and (laughs) I'm ready to spend the summer at home, and I literally, I couldn't, so luckily a family friend let me stay with them. My mother sort of receded from traditional society, and kind of, uh, she went into voluntary homelessness, which is stuff that you read about, right, or like you see in a movie, and all of a sudden, it was happening to me. So it was pretty scary just in t- trying to figure out. I, I mean, I, for a minute, for a second, I thought I might be d- doomed. Like, like, okay, well, everything's done. I was living out of my a car, which was a 1993 Honda Accord. It was like the best thing to ever happen to me because luckily I kept some of the stuff I wanted to keep inside the car. And uh, I would go see my high school sweetheart pretty often. And pretty soon his parents caught on to what was happening. So One day they kind of just started unpacking my car and I walked out and they were like, you're staying with us for the summer. And so it was like this the the grand and I was able to get back on my feet with, uh, you know, getting that that old job back, trying to figure out financially how I'd get back to college. But that was probably the darkest time, one of them that I've experienced and then probably the year to follow because. I was getting readjusted to the world in school. I did make it back to college, but I was trying to navigate it without parents who at the time were my biggest mentors, my biggest support. I was, you know, trying to navigate it without, without that financial stability. So scholarships were everything. And it was like the first time you really discover the word hustle or failure. And I kind of just decided that failure wasn't going to be the word. It was, and it was weird. I was like, oh, this is when. This is the stuff I read about when people work really hard. And so so there I was, but it was got really lonely. I was super lonely. It was sad. It was pretty, it was a lonely time for me, just having lost my immediate family and not yet being, being aware that I actually had a network of people that I'd met through my life that were about to cheer me on and make sure that I wasn't failing at all. But usually you don't reach out to those aunts and uncles and family friends because you're so comfortable in that immediate family. So I had to really span beyond. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And and you've come so far, you know, obviously by what we just yeah. mentioned before, the whole bio and all that while wow, you're doing big things in the world. And I, I know we're going to talk about this at the end and you also are paying it forward by some of the projects, some of the passion projects that you are working on. So I also wanted to ask you, the aha moment. What was that aha moment that helped empower you back then out of that life storm? If there's anything you can recall. Oh, totally. Yeah. No, some people are like, some people really have to dig for that. But I had this defining moment for sure. 
And again, I, it all goes back to gratitude, which we just talked about earlier in the show. But that moment actually came a few months after I had gone back. And my nanny who raised me, she didn't have to do any of this, but she actually kind of decorate, redecorated this tiny little room in her house and painted it all white and was sort of filling it with childhood knickknacks so that I could go and stay with her whenever I wanted to go back home. And I was trying to figure out where she was getting all these childhood items. And she said that she had kept them from the house, but the timeline didn't make sense. And so what I actually found out was uh, I was sitting with her, I was visiting for my birthday and she pulled out a small marble jar and I immediately recognized it. And she actually pulled out my grandmother's urn and my grandmother, who I loved more than anything in this world, I modeled everything after her when I was little. She was just like my everything. And I was, I, I was never really try, trying to figure out where her remains had gone from the house, but they were presented to me. And then my nanny said that she was really just going through to various swap meets and flea markets through that year and buying my childhood items back because I didn't know this, but my, our storage units had been sold to the state of California. So everything from the house actually was sold. And when she told me that, we, you know, I was crying and so was she, but not for the reason she expected. I was, I had this sigh of this like overwhelming feeling of gratitude and relief and just to be so honored that someone would put that time in to a going to get my items and b care so much to see me to see me live that way it was the most amazing feeling i've ever had and i felt more abundant than i ever have in my entire life and it was in that ironic moment of finding out that all of my actual material items were gone <laughs> I'm like, and i'm like oh you don't need any of those it was crazy i was staring at you know what's a little bit morbid she bought my <laughs> grandmother's urn for $3.99 and in reality I never knew they were gone because every memory that counted and every lesson I had ever learned had stayed with me. And then I started really realizing that I'm, I'm more than equipped. It was that aha moment of, I have everything I need. So it was beautiful. I would loved it. I, I will never forget that moment ever. So, and yeah, great relationship to this day. I love her so much. <laughs> Grandmothers and nannies. That is awesome, Erica. Thank you so much for sharing that. It is funny how, just somebody doing a small thing, a small, thoughtful act of kindness could make such a big difference in our lives. So I thank you so much for sharing this. Erica, you are such an inspiration, the way you're being transparent and authentic and just being delightful, even though you're sharing stories that are not always as upbeat. So thank you so much. I commend you for sharing. I'm sure Thrive Nation is absolutely loving this. So my next question is was there a mantra, Erica, that you used to help you throughout your day as you were going through these challenges and struggles back then? You know, I wouldn't say then, but now there is a mantra that I've um, recently just been repeating, which is really nice and actually uh, applicable to that situation. And I think I just didn't didn't really identify what it was until now. But it's uh, Tony Robbins actually says uh, the quality of your life is where you live emotionally. And that is true for anything that you'll ever come up with, anything that you want materialistically, anything that you want uh, spiritually, it all lives in how you feel. So really monitoring, monitoring my state of being, my state of mind, whether it was in gratitude and happiness and excitement and love, if you don't have that now, Anything that you think stands between you and success or you and getting what you want or having what you want um, is never, ever going to fill is never, ever going to fill that um, that ideal of of becoming successful, because all being successful is, is having an amazing uh, emotional, emotional state and being fulfilled by the quality of your life. So if you're fulfilled now in every moment, then you are literally at the vibrational level to attract everything else that you're going to need to succeed. And so that's one of the things that I've been repeating that I really love and was so applicable then as well. So the quality of our life is determined by where we live emotionally. Super powerful stuff. I love that mantra by Tony Robbins. And speaking of coaches, what is the best advice that you've received, Erica, from a coach or mentor? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I received some amazing advice from a coach and mentor, um, lucky enough to train with and work with uh, Kyle Wilson. He was behind Jim Rohn. I don't know if you're familiar with Jim Rohn, but he's like the godfather of personal development. And one of the things that kept coming up for me and probably a lot of entrepreneurs is that uh, a lot of opportunity in coming and stressing you out. And essentially, it's not really, oh my God, I can't say no, but it's like all of these things keep coming in and you get overwhelmed and stressed because of the impact of so many things coming in at once. And they all look like great opportunities. And he said that that literally should be the gauge that you're playing at the level that you're meant to be playing at. And then he reminded me that when you're playing small, a portion of your pie is going to be the items that you just can't get to. So when you're playing big, the portion stays the same, which means if you're playing bigger, that portion of the pie is just going to get bigger. And the stress and being overwhelmed, um, well, rather the, the things that induce that are never going to stop. They're going to multiply. And that's how you're going to know you're doing it right. And it just made me feel comfortable and that it was totally normal to feel overwhelmed. And also that when you're playing at high levels, everything looks like a 10. So don't be fooled by thinking that you're missing out or that you're choosing wrong or making wrong decisions. You're choosing between nines, eights, nines, and tens. Uh, the fours, they're not so much anymore. So that's why it seems a lot more difficult to make those decisions. And that was a great piece of advice that I got to deal with it. Oh my God, Erica, I love this. This makes so much sense, especially when you're playing, like you said, at that next level. And I'm choosing all day, every day, pretty much with eights and nines. And I'm wondering, oh, how am I going to get all this stuff done? But it's an exciting. So the challenge is don't get smaller. You get stronger. And that's what I've learned throughout this process. So thank you for sharing that, Erica. Awesome tips. Awesome advice. Totally. Yeah, exactly. No going back. You're just done. Like, bring on the tens. I'll choose between 10 tens all day. <laughs> Amen to the tens. Yes. So if you could share with us a two to three step formula for Thrive Nation, anybody out there that maybe perhaps went through some of the same similar hurdles and struggles that you went through, or maybe they're looking to capitalize on media and garner that attention that you've collected for yourself and done very well, I might add, what is the two to three step formula you could share with us today? Yeah, two things do come to mind. I mean, if I had to really delve it down and someone was looking to A, overcome something and B, achieve uh, the type of things in the entrepreneurial realm or the entertainment realm uh, that I've been lucky enough to take part in, I'd say step one is step one is, is literally you. It's, it's within you, it's yourself and it's your, um, your mindset. So I think a lot more people are familiar with the law of attraction now as it's pretty mainstream. Um, however, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of versions of this, of making sure that you are in the right state of mind to attract the things that you want. So I'd say step one is mindset empowerment and knowing that your story matters, the things you want to do matter. And this is the big one. If you're trying to overcome something, you have enough, uh, never a deficit. You can never, ever come from a pace, place of lack and expect to get anything that is going to be fulfilling. It will always be lacking. So, uh, if you really establish a mindset of becoming whole in what you have and knowing and being becoming empowered by the tools and items that you have at your disposal, uh, you are more than enough. And it's crazy. I used to hear that and be like, oh, that's so cliche. And then I realized the reason I hear it all the time is because the places I hear it are probably mainstream platforms where mainstream media personalities are on the other end of the speaker saying it really matters if you believe you can do it or not. So that's step one. Step two, I would say, connect and take action. Those are the biggest, um, so maybe you could break that into two, into three steps, but connect with people, uh, really, really forge a, an authentic, sincere relationship. And that will lead to the sincere successes if you take action on what you've been talking about. That action consists of, you know, listening for what they have going on in their lives, trying to figure out ways to serve them and to help them, uh, expecting nothing in return or taking action on partnerships that you've proposed or ways that you could help each other. A lot of people stop at the relationship portion and really you have to take the action afterward to move everything forward. So I would say uh, mindset empowerment, 
connect, connection, human connection, and taking action. I love that. So those are the, the success principle basics right there that you mentioned. And I love how you said knowing that you are enough. So not being in that lack, that scarcity mindset is so big, so huge. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah. And connecting with others. Yes. Building that interaction that engagement because we cannot do this alone. So many of us get into that mindset. Ah, I don't I don't need anybody's help. I'll, I'll Google it. I'll figure it out on YouTube. I'll DIY it. No, sorry. Wrong answer. Engage. Connect with mentors that already have done it. They know the shortcuts, they know the ins and outs, and and every industry is going to be evolving. So they're in the trenches, on the cutting edge. They're going to save you time, energy, effort, money, (laughs) Yeah. all of the above. And then you said third and last, the most important thing, Erica, take massive freaking action. action. That's the name (laughs) of the game. So many people get stopped. They get stuck at the relationship portion. Well, I got a mentor now. Oh, I got a coach. Yeah. Okay, well, don't get bummed because you didn't take accountability. It's because the first thing that you mentioned is mindset empowerment, mindset mastery is the most important thing. If you can't master the six inches between your ears, don't expect to master anything else outside of you, right? Exactly. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, And the huge thing that I always see, and I, I see it just more often than not, is that first step of, like you said, master, um, you know, master the mindset and the six inches between your ears. I love that. Uh, That really is, I mean, people feel that sense of lack with the tiniest items sometimes. If they don't ever accomplish anything in that room, or if they don't have, you know, access to this mentor, or, you know, just these little, little, little things, if they're not dressed appropriately, sometimes it'll literally send you into the tailspin of failure before you've even gotten onto the court. So I would just really be mindful of that in the endeavors. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Erica. So now we're going to go into like a deep dive question. So take your time answering this. Now, a hundred years from today, there's a statue erected in Erica's name, right? Uh oh. <laughs> and this this pretty cool looking statue has a little tagline on the bottom of it, and it is the one thing that Erica is to be remembered for that was legendary. So what would that one thing be? And take your time answering. Got it. That's a really great question. Wow. Um, and this is a hundred years from now. Hmm. So it's interesting. Something came, I have no idea where this came from, but thinking of a statue and iconic figures who leave legendary lessons behind, um, who I am and who I show up for in this world is the possibility of happiness, joy, and play. So I hope that people leave with a sense of uh, being empowered, inspired, and just genuinely happy after they, after we've had an encounter or after I've worked with someone or after I've spoken to an audience and uh, doing it with, doing it in taste. And when I say in taste, just maintaining, not taking those yucky shortcuts or wronging people and just making sure that you are in the sense morally uh that's in line with the best values possible so maybe the statue um let's see the statue might say erica delacruz class grace always a smile on her face <laughs> oh, the tagline under that might say that and hopefully it empower people um to really aim and, and aim for the stars a lot of people think they have to compromise their moral compass um or their value system, or the way that they carry themselves, or change to achieve success, or fame, or whatever it is that they're seeking. And I am such a firm believer that you can maintain all three and still be happy. So I'd really love for in 100 years to be remembered and known for that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I love that. And it's definitely yeah. coming coming across this feed, no doubt, that Yay! she's all smiles, <laughs> all play, all about the happiness. I love that. Good. Good, good. I'm glad. (laughs) (laughs) So Erica De La Cruz, where can we connect with you? What's the best place to go? Yeah, awesome. Um, Well, I'm on all social, uh, all social feeds. So Facebook, my public page is Erica De La Cruz. 
And uh, Erica with a K, and then Dela Cruz is three words, so it's capital D E space capital L A space capital C R U Z. My whole life, it's been like this mouthful. And then um, Instagram and Twitter, I love tweeting, I love uh, posting any and all. So you can reach me there. It's uh, under pardon at underscore, and then my full name Erica Dela Cruz. And if you'd like to connect, I'm working with um, people who want to write. So. If you're interested in sharing your story for the world, I would love to hear from you. Um, Also to be shown in the spotlight for what you've been up to in your career trajectory and in your personal life. The two go hand in hand. Um, My email is erica at ericadelacruz.com. So it's pretty simple. It has been an honor. Thank you, Erica, for stopping by Thriving Beyond. Yay! And we wish you the best and definitely connect with her if you want to get in touch with your narrative. Super important for your branding. Wow, Erica De La Cruz rocked out this episode. Make sure to head on over to thrivingbeyondpodcast.com and catch all of the episode description details. That way you can connect with Erica and learn more about her and what she's doing out there and Callie doing her thing. Head on over to thrivingbeyondpodcast.com for all the details and more. And as always, keep going, keep growing, and keep on thriving because it's way better than just surviving. Make it a great one. Thanks for listening. For recaps and to claim bonus gifts, head over to thrivingbeyondpodcast.com. Keep thriving.